You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Thanks for tuning in to episode number 68 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Welcome to the podcast. As y'all will recall, Rich and I used the last episode to cover the Battle of Wilson's Creek, which took place in southwest Missouri on August 10, 1861. The federal commander, Nathaniel Lyon, was killed at Wilson's Creek, but his men, despite having suffered heavy casualties during the fighting, managed to retreat back to Springfield, then withdraw to Rolla. Immediately after the battle at Wilson's Creek, the victorious commanders, Ben McCulloch, Sterling Price, and N. Bart Pierce, they met in Springfield to plan the Southern Army's next move. Sterling Price, the commander of the Missouri State Guard, wanted to capitalize on the victory at Wilson's Creek by marching north and striking out for the Missouri River. Price argued that such an advance would not only threaten Union control of the important waterway, but would also allow reinforcements from the northern part of Missouri to enter the ranks of the State Guard. Price was specifically looking at the town of Lexington as a base of operations on the river. About 150 miles almost due north of Springfield, Lexington was a bustling river town of over 4,000 people, the majority of whom were sympathetic to the Southern cause, and so Price knew that the town would be a source of valuable supplies and provisions, and would also serve nicely as a focal point for recruiting. In addition, Price and Claiborne Fox Jackson apparently wanted to seize the money the bank in Lexington owed the state of Missouri. But Ben McCulloch, the Confederate commander in Arkansas and the Indian Territory, wasn't persuaded by Price's argument. He agreed that Lexington could be seized from the Federals, but McCulloch didn't believe the Southern Army would be able to hold the town for any length of time, and so any benefit from capturing the place would only be temporary. Besides that, McCulloch still had little confidence in Price's Missouri State Guardsmen and didn't believe the scruffy, undisciplined force was capable of undertaking another campaign immediately after Wilson's Creek. McCulloch instead suggested that while the State Guard went through some much-needed additional training, the Southern Army could consolidate its hold on Springfield, call the state legislature to meet there, and the politicians could pass an ordinance of secession and take Missouri out of the Union. But Sterling Price refused to consider such a course, thinking it much too passive, too conservative. And so on August 25th, two weeks after its victory at the Battle of Wilson's Creek, the Southern Coalition Army broke apart. Ben McCulloch and N. Bart Pierce took their Arkansas State troops and Confederate soldiers back to northwest Arkansas, while Price marched the Missouri State Guard toward another encounter with the Federals. About 6,000 State Guardsmen followed Sterling Price out of Springfield. They were dressed in civilian clothing and carrying mostly civilian weapons, shotguns, hunting rifles, and other arms brought from home. They were still low on ammunition and supplies, and they needed further training, but the ragtag Citizens Army nevertheless hoped for a chance to free Missouri from the yoke of federal oppression. On the way to Lexington, the State Guard veered west to threaten Fort Scott, a free state community that had grown up around an abandoned army post just over the Kansas border. James H. Lane and 1,200 Kansans sallied forth from Fort Scott to ambush the advancing State Guardsmen, 
and on September 2nd, they caught the Missourians by surprise near Big Dry Wood Creek, about a dozen miles east of the fort. But despite being caught by surprise, Price's troops maintained their composure and soon had the Jayhawkers on the run. This two-hour skirmish is sometimes called the Battle of the Mules, since Lane, to speed his retreat, abandoned his mules and the supplies they carried to the victorious Missourians. Sterling Price declined to pursue the retreating Kansans, reporting to Claiborne Fox Jackson that, quote, It is my earnest desire to keep my army within Missouri, end quote. But Price did vow that if in the future Jayhawkers raided across the border into Missouri, he would march into Kansas and, quote, lay waste to the farms and utterly destroy the cities and villages of that state, end quote. And so the state guard continued marching toward the real object of its campaign, the town of Lexington on the Missouri River. On Thursday, September 12th, Price's advance guard approached the outskirts of Lexington and skirmished with the Federals defending the town. The fighting that day represented the first shots fired in the battle for possession of the town. The Federal skirmishers met the enemy about a mile outside of Lexington and conducted a stubborn fighting withdrawal, using hedges, fences, and even the town cemetery for cover. The Federal force ordered to hold Lexington was commanded by Colonel James Mulligan. Mulligan was a lawyer by training who had capitalized on his experience as a militia captain and prominent Irish-American in Chicago to gain the colonelcy of the 23rd Illinois, a unit known as the Irish Brigade because it was mostly made up of Irish-American volunteers from Chicago. At Lexington, Mulligan had his own 23rd Illinois, seven companies of the 1st Illinois Cavalry under Colonel Thomas Marshall, Colonel Everett Peabody's 13th Missouri Infantry, and also about 350 Missouri Home Guards. All told, Mulligan had about 3,500 men to defend Lexington, along with seven six-pounder cannon and two mortars. Unlike Price's state guardsmen, most of the Federals were reasonably well-armed, although the troopers of the 1st Illinois Cavalry had only their sabers and pistols. When word had reached Mulligan that the enemy was advancing toward Lexington, he had sent a message to his immediate superior, Colonel Jefferson C. Davis, asking for reinforcements and rations so that he could, quote, hold out to the last, end quote. And just a footnote, but Colonel Jefferson Davis, besides having an especially memorable name for an officer in the Union Army, he'd actually been a lieutenant serving under Major Robert Anderson in the garrison of Fort Sumter, at the outbreak of the war in April 1861. By the end of the war, Davis will hold the brevet rank of Major General. He'll also have achieved notoriety during the war for murdering a fellow officer. But that's a story for another episode. Okay, so Mulligan has been ordered to defend Lexington, but he realizes that the enemy is approaching the town with a force at least two or three times the size of his own. So he sent a message to Davis asking for reinforcements and provisions, but then he immediately set his men to work fortifying College Hill, which was a height near the river overlooking the northern part of Lexington. The hill took its name from the Masonic College, where Mulligan established his headquarters. This three-story building was described as, quote, a large, plain brick building with a shingle roof and wooden gables, end quote and two other structures were close by, a boarding house that was about 50 yards nearer the river than the college, and, even closer to the river, the fine brick home of a fellow named Anderson. Mulligan had his men construct a rectangular earthen fort surrounding the college building. The walls of this stronghold reportedly were 12 feet high and 12 feet thick, with bastions at the angles and with embrasures for guns. And then around that fort, from 200 to 800 feet away, was an outer line of entrenchments, which was enhanced by traverses, occasional redoubts, and a good ditch and other impediments. A bit farther out to the north and west were some rifle pits. Mulligan's men built a respectable set of fortifications on good ground, but he didn't have nearly enough soldiers to adequately man them, Besides that, several key terrain features remained outside the Federal defensive works, the Anderson House to the west, 
and the springs of water to the north and south. On September 12th, Price's advance guard eventually pushed the stubborn federal skirmishers back into the College Hill position, and then two state guard batteries kept up a brisk fire on the defenders for about an hour and a half. The federal guns responded, and Sterling Price had a close call when a piece of shell destroyed his field glasses, but he himself escaped injury. Price opted not to make an immediate assault on the enemy works that day because his men were exhausted from the hard marching during the last push to reach Lexington, and many of them hadn't eaten in 36 hours. That night, both commanders held councils of war to solicit the opinions of their subordinates. On College Hill, Mulligan's officers all agreed that evacuation was the best option. But then Mulligan weighed in, exclaiming, quote, Gentlemen, I have heard what you have to say, but begad, we'll fight them. That's what we enlisted for, and that's what we'll do. End quote. Meanwhile, Sterling Price had set up his headquarters at the local fairgrounds, about two miles from the federal position on College Hill. There, a few of his officers argued for carrying the enemy works by assault, but the majority agreed that a siege was the best course of action, for unless the Federals were reinforced or broke out of their works, then victory for the Southerners was inevitable. Price agreed, saying, quote, We got him, dead sure. All we have to do is watch him. End quote. The next day, Friday the 13th, was a soggy, miserable day, but nevertheless the Federals worked energetically in the drenching rain to strengthen their earthworks. As their enemy labored to improve the College Hill defenses, Sterling Price's state guardsmen moved to surround the town, but there was no serious fighting. In fact, other than minor skirmishing, there was no serious fighting for five days. During that time, the state guards' numbers swelled as word spread that Price had the Yankees trapped, and increasing numbers of recruits flocked to Lexington. By the 18th, Sterling Price had around 15,000 men under his command, although thousands of them were green as could be and were unarmed. Meanwhile, Mulligan's situation on College Hill was worsening. Rations were already growing short, but the most serious concern was the defender's water supply. As long as the Federals had access to the river and nearby springs, there was sufficient water for the men and for the scores of horses and mules inside the works. But, should that access be cut off, the situation would quickly become critical. Finally, on Wednesday, September 18th, Price moved his State Guard divisions forward to invest the Federal works and begin the formal siege of Mulligan's position. As the cheering State Guardsmen moved through the town, one Federal officer noted at 9 a.m. that, quote, They are coming. The drums have sounded the alarm. We are all at our posts. End quote. The defenders stood grimly silent, watching the enemy deploy all around College Hill. Father Thaddeus Butler, chaplain of the 23rd Illinois, circulated among the men, blessing them. Accompanying the State Guard infantry divisions were five batteries of artillery, totaling 16 guns. Even Mulligan was impressed with the spectacle of the enemy's advance, saying, quote, They came as one dark moving mass, their guns gleaming in the sun, their banners waving, and their drums beating. Everywhere, as far as we could see, were men, 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 approaching grandly, end quote. Mulligan faced two crises that day. The first was also the most controversial event of the siege. It occurred about noon when Thomas Harris, commanding the second division of the state guard, ordered his men to storm the Anderson House, located just outside the federal lines to the west and being used by Mulligan as a hospital. When they seized the house without opposition, the state guardsmen captured a surgeon, Father Butler, and over a hundred sick and wounded Union soldiers. The state guardsmen then used the house as cover to snipe at the nearby Federal entrenchments. Mulligan was enraged that the enemy had seized the Anderson house, despite the fact it was identified as a hospital, and so he ordered the house retaken, telling his men to, quote, Teach the damned vagabonds what it means to charge a hospital and abuse wounded men and insult a priest. End quote. 
There's some controversy as to which part of Mulligan's command recaptured the house, although according to Mulligan, it was Company B of the 23rd Illinois. But one fact is beyond dispute. When the Federal soldiers had retaken the Anderson house, they showed the state guardsmen captured inside no quarter. Five guardsmen were cut off on the top floor and unable to retreat when the Federals rushed the house. Three of those Missourians were killed after they surrendered. One escaped that fate when one of the Union wounded concealed him after he identified himself as a Mason, and the other guardsmen managed to avoid being cut down only when a kind-hearted Federal soldier saved him and escorted him out of the house and into the College Hill lines. Although the Federals had managed to retake the Anderson house, their hold on the place was short-lived, since the State Guard recaptured it early that evening and then held it for the remainder of the siege. For many years after the fighting at Lexington, the hospital controversy raged with one side claiming the State Guard set off the chain of events when it seized a building marked as a hospital, while the other side declared that it was improper for the Federals to locate a hospital at such a strategic point at a location just outside the defensive works. Whatever the merits of the respective arguments, there was clearly no excuse for the killing of the three state guardsmen after they were captured inside the Anderson house. The second crisis Mulligan faced that day involved the defenders' access to the Missouri River. After the Anderson house had been seized by the state guard, Another detachment of Missourians cut off Mulligan's force from the river, and in the process, they managed to capture a steamboat loaded with supplies and a ferry boat that were docked along the river. Sterling Price rejoiced, knowing that the Federals were now cut off from their major source of water, and with the College Hill position now surrounded, the two springs outside the defensive lines were also now just as inaccessible to Mulligan's men. And so very quickly, inside the hot and dusty defensive works, the Federals were not only plagued by a constant harassing fire from the encircling state guard, but they were also now tormented by a desperate, morale-sapping thirst. On the second day of the siege, September 19th, a couple of desperate Union soldiers dashed from the entrenchments and tried to reach one of the springs, but they were cut down by enemy fire almost as soon as they started off. That night, several other Federals were captured or killed as they attempted to steal outside the lines and reach water. Meanwhile, Mulligan ordered two wells to be dug on the night of the 19th, but neither produced any water. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. Mulligan's men suffered a demoralizing blow on Thursday the 19th, the second day of the siege, when hoped-for reinforcements failed to make an appearance. 
The beleaguered Union soldiers had been told that if they could hold out until the 19th, a relief force would arrive to break the siege and reinforce them, and so they listened all day for the sound of fighting outside the town. Mulligan later wrote, quote, But they looked and listened in vain, and all day long they fought without water, their parched lips cracking, their tongues swollen, and the blood running down their chins when they bit their cartridges and the saltpeter entered their blistered lips. End quote. Western Department Commander John C. Fremont's attention had been focused on the portion of his command bordering the Mississippi River, but the potential disaster at Lexington out on the Missouri River finally forced his attention to turn to that spot, and he did make an effort to reinforce Mulligan's command. Orders were issued from Fremont's headquarters in St. Louis, sending three columns moving toward Lexington. But lack of initiative and an almost total absence of urgency on the part of Fremont's subordinates meant that two of those relief columns never got anywhere near the besieged town. The third column, however, made it to within four miles of Lexington. That force was led by Samuel Sturgis, whose name should be familiar to you guys from the last episode on Wilson's Creek, since Sturgis took over command of the Federal Army at Wilson's Creek after Nathaniel Lyon's death. But anyway, here, five weeks or so after Wilson's Creek, Sturgis led a column of 1,200 men toward Lexington, and he got so close he heard the sound of cannon in the town on the morning of September 19th. At that point, when he was about four miles away from Lexington, he formed his men into line of battle, but then he encountered some enemy pickets, and his advance stalled. Sturgis actually never moved any closer to the town, since he was also warned by a sympathetic local man that Sterling Price had 5,000 men waiting to ambush him. Sturgis believed the report, called a halt, and then withdrew and moved his force off toward Kansas City. That warning had actually been correct. On the 18th, Price's men had captured a messenger with the note who Sturgis had sent ahead to try and reach Mulligan, and Price, forewarned by that information, had ordered a large force of state guardsmen out to intercept the Federal Relief Column. At any rate, Sturgis's withdrawal meant that the hungry and thirsty Federals besieged in Lexington were doomed. It was on the second day of the siege, the same day that Sturgis's column turned around and withdrew toward Kansas City, it was on that day that Sterling Price's men, besieging the Federals in Lexington, discovered the key that would give them victory. On that day, Thomas A. Harris, the same State Guard commander who had ordered his men to storm the Anderson House, Harris apparently ordered his men to use bales of hemp as crude fortifications against the enemy fire coming from the College Hill lines. No one seems to be quite sure where the hemp bales came from. Some say they were brought over from the nearby town of Wellington. Others claim they were taken from that captured steamship or were found in warehouses along the river. But regardless of where the bales of hemp came from, Harris soon discovered that once wet, the bales, in the words of one Missourian, became, quote, as solid and heavy as lead, end quote. And so by the evening of the 19th, not only Harris's force, but also other state guardsmen, had employed the wet hemp bales as makeshift but effective fortifications. The third and final day of the formal siege, Friday, September 20th, began with the State Guard artillery bombardment focused on the college building inside the Federal Defensive Works. Then the Missourians added small arms fire, gradually building in intensity, and throughout the morning the trapped Union soldiers expected an all-out assault but none came. There was no all-out assault by Price's men because they had hit upon the idea of using the hemp bales as cover as they moved slowly forward toward the Federal lines. As mentioned before, the bales had, at first, simply been used as crude breastworks, but now a line of them, perhaps 200 yards long, was employed as a mobile palisade. Captain Wilson of the State Guard described how the bales were used. Quote, Two or three men would get behind a bale, roll it a while, then stop and shoot a while. A line would be advanced in this way as close as we thought proper, and while the men lay behind and fired, a second line would be rolled up and placed on top of the first. End quote. 
In this way, the Missourians inched ever closer to the federal lines. Harris recalled that the movement of the hemp bales, quote, elicited the obstinate resentment of the enemy, who was profuse in the bestowal of round and grape shot, and was not at all economical of his many balls, end quote. But despite their best efforts, the defenders could not stop the state guard's relentless advance. Even the fire from the Federal's six-pounder cannon would only cause the heavy, wet bales to rock a little and then settle back. By early afternoon, the line of hemp bales had moved dangerously close to Mulligan's entrenchments, and the excited Missourians were moving and firing between and over the bales, shooting at any Union soldier who dared expose himself on the west side of the College Hill defensive works. At 1 p.m., the only hand-to-hand combat of the siege took place when some of Harris's state guardsmen leapt over the bales of hemp and rushed forward. The Federals in that section of the defensive works, no doubt relieved to escape the constant sniping and now have a real enemy to grapple with, they jumped out of their entrenchments and ran toward the charging Missourians. After a brief melee in the no-man's land between the lines, the Missourians succeeded in driving the Yankees back. But then the exact sequence of events becomes rather hopelessly confused. But someone raised a white handkerchief as a flag of truce, perhaps to see if the other side would let them retrieve their wounded from between the lines. But as that signal was seen by others, the firing suddenly ceased on other parts of the line as well. At the same time, it seems that some of the Union soldiers who had been pushed back by the charging Missourians had reached the end of their endurance and were now running about, spreading panic inside the Federal lines. By about 1.30 p.m., Major Becker of the Missouri Home Guard, amidst the growing confusion on College Hill, believed himself to be the highest-ranking unwounded officer inside the Federal defenses, and he raised a white flag to the west of the College building. Sterling Price sent an aide with a flag of truce to find out why the Federals had ceased firing and raised a white flag, but Mulligan, who had been wounded twice, replied that he didn't know, unless it was Price who was surrendering. But then Mulligan discovered that Becker had raised a white flag. Bitterly frustrated that one of his subordinates had made such a signal, the still feisty Federal commander ordered his men back to their positions and was ready to resume the battle and make a last stand. But at a council of war held in the college building, only two of the six officers present voted to continue the fight. A dejected mulligan wrote that, at that point, quote, then the flag of truce was sent out with our surrender, end quote. By 5 p.m., the defeated Federals had stacked their arms, and the stars and stripes flying from the roof of the college building had been replaced by the victorious Missouri State Guard's flag. In a final flourish, though, Mulligan's 23rd Illinois, the Irish Brigade, marched around the inside of the fort as their band played, with their flag bearing the image of a gold harp of Aaron on a green field flying before them. Some of the Missouri State Guardsmen were so disgusted by this display that they threatened to open fire again, but it was only after their show of defiance that the 23rd Illinois stacked their arms and furled their flag. Before receiving their parole, the captured Yankees were forced to listen to an angry speech delivered by Claiborne Fox Jackson, in which he harangued the Federals, demanding to know what business they had to make war in Missouri. Only after being upbraided by Jackson were the prisoners released. Sterling Price had little choice but to release them on parole, since it was all he could do to feed and move his state guardsmen, let alone have a few thousand prisoners added into the mix. Mulligan himself refused parole, insisting that Price had no authority over a federal officer. And so Mulligan and his 19-year-old wife, who arrived in Lexington after the siege began, they stayed on as guests of Sterling Price until the end of October when they returned to St. Louis. Mulligan was eventually exchanged for Daniel Frost, the militia commander of Camp Jackson, who y'all will recall from back in episode number 64. Pinning down the number of casualties on both sides during the Battle of the Hemp Bales is difficult. Price claimed he suffered 25 killed and 72 wounded out of a force that had swollen in size to at least 16,000 men by the end of the siege. But more likely are the figures reported later, 38 killed and 150 wounded. 
Federal losses seem to have been about 39 killed and 120 wounded. Price claimed to have taken 3,500 prisoners, five pieces of artillery, over 3,000 stands of arms, over 700 horses, a large stock of ammunition, and about $900,000 seized from the Lexington Bank by the Federals before the siege began. Unfortunately for Price and Jackson, the fruits of their victory soon soured, as the federal disaster at Lexington finally prodded a shaken John C. Fremont into belatedly leaving St. Louis with an army of 38,000 men and marching toward a climactic battle with the bothersome Missouri State Guard. And so Ben McCulloch's prediction in Springfield that Price wouldn't be able to hold Lexington and any benefits gained would be temporary proved to be accurate. On September 29th, less than two weeks after their victory, Price ordered the State Guard to withdraw from Lexington, and he advised the thousands of eager recruits who had flocked to his banner to return to their homes and wait for a more opportune time to join the ranks of the State Guard. Price, his numbers constantly dwindling, eventually fell back all the way to Neosho in southwest Missouri, where, despite the fact that Missouri's functioning civil government was firmly on the side of the Union, a rump, or pro-Confederate minority version of the state legislature, passed an ordinance of secession in late October. To the northern public, the defeat at Lexington in September 1861 was a bitter pill to swallow, following as closely as it did the defeats at First Manassas and Wilson's Creek. In two months of command, Fremont appeared to have lost half of Missouri to the rebels. To the pro-Southern Missourians and to the Confederates, Lexington was a tremendous triumph, but it also turned out to be the last major victory won by Sterling Price and the Missouri State Guard. Never again would the Confederates be as hopeful of delivering Missouri from federal occupation. All right, well, next week we'll wrap up, for the time being, our coverage of events in Missouri with an episode we've tentatively titled Fremont's Follies. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is actually an article in a back issue of North and South magazine. The third issue of North and South, from back in February 1998, has an excellent article on the Battle of Lexington by Jeff Harris. As always, you can find all of our book and other recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. You can also go to the website to make a donation to help support the podcast, which is what Craig O. from Washington State and Edward C. from Ireland did this past week, and they were also the last ones to qualify for our t-shirt giveaway. So it is time to see who won the podcast t-shirt. We've put everyone's names in a hat, and some of you either really wanted to win the shirt or were just very generous in supporting the podcast, but some of you made some great donations, and so your names went into the hat um, on multiple slips of paper. But everyone's names are all in the hat. It is a Pittsburgh Steelers hat, so we hope that doesn't jinx anyone, except someone who might be a Ravens fan. But anyway, Tracy will now pull out a slip of paper. And the winner is Ellis from Georgia. Congratulations. Excellent. Uh, Ellis actually corresponds with us. We've... um, been glad to hear from him often. So congratulations, Ellis, and thanks for your continuing support of the podcast. And we hope you'll wear the shirt with delight and dare we say pride. And we're sorry we can't give each of you guys a t-shirt, but we can say thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. We hope you'll join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.